Bounded rationality is basically a gateway drug into behavioral economics. And the reason for that is because it points out the fact that if we were to optimize every single choice in our life, that would probably be irrational. So we might consider the decision about what jam to buy for your toast. And if you imagine all of the possible jams that you could possibly buy within a hundred mile radius of your house, it's going to be a lot of them. And we could think like an economist and think of what are the vector of factors that you would have to consider. So this might include sweetness, tartness, how watery is it, how many chunks are in the jam, what are the size of the chunks, um, are there strawberry berries in there? What flavor, grape, peach, strawberry? Um, there's so many decisions that are part of that one decision that could get you to the optimal jam. But if you spend all of your time doing taste tests of different jars of jam against one another, maybe testing them according to your mood, different time of day, um, how long do they last? There's so many factors. You're going to be putting so much effort into a decision that just isn't that important. Now, alternatively, you could just try a bunch of jams until you get one that's good enough and then move on and let that be the jam you have every day, even if you could get a better jam if you put more effort into trying. That's the idea behind bounded rationality. Now think of all the decisions you make every day of your life and what if you put the same amount of effort into every little decision you made just to make sure that decision was optimized? Would that optimization be worth it? I mean, for one, there's probably not enough time or effort in your life to even be able to do that. But if you tried to live like that, that would be completely irrational. And so you have to ask the question, do we need irrationality to live a rational life? Um, and we have some tools for thinking about this in behavioral economics. One of those tools is what is the frame of your thinking? What's, do you have a broad frame or a narrow frame in your decision making? And an example of broad versus narrow framing would be how much coffee do you buy every week? So there's two different frames for making this decision. One frame is as you're walking down the street on the way to work, how much coffee do you buy today? How expensive is that coffee? How much do you want to pay for it? What size of cup, etc. So that would be one decision. Um, and it's going to give you a certain weekly budget, a certain monthly budget of money you spend on coffee. A different frame for basically the same decision is how much do you want to budget for coffee in your monthly budget? Um, and that's a decision where you're sort of looking at your whole life and making the decision in the context of your life with other trade-offs that are not necessarily on your mind as you're walking down the street on the way to work. And you're probably going to get a different answer if that is your frame, if you have this broader frame of the entire budget for your life as opposed to the narrow frame of decision making, how much coffee to buy when you're walking down the street. So broad versus narrow framing is going to help us think more clearly about bounded rationality and about um, how much irrationality do we need to live a rational life. And when you consider the coffee example, it becomes fairly clear that um, zooming out and doing a broader frame overview of your life, how should you allocate your money, how should you allocate your decision-making energy, how should you allocate your mental energy, that zoom back is really, really valuable and really important in living a good life. And sometimes we find that the narrow frame and the broad frame are mutually exclusive. Just like you can't perfectly optimize the jam that you buy and also perfectly optimize um, the allocation of your mental energy across your life. And that's what bounded rationality is all about. It's about acknowledging that we have limits on our ability to make perfectly optimized decisions. And there's various types of limits we face. I mean, one type of limit is the limit on the amount of information that we can get, or at least the amount of information we can get um, without an unreasonable amount of effort. That's one type of limit. It's the informational limit. Another type of limit at play is the limit on the total amount of decision-making energy we have in a day. Cognitive effort is a scarce resource. 
decision-making energy is a scarce resource. And you might ask the question, is decision-making energy really a scarce resource? Like, when we make certain decisions, does that use up our ability to make other decisions? Because of course, you might imagine making more decisions could make you more efficient at making decisions, and maybe that's true. But there is actually some evidence that decision-making energy behaves at least a little bit like a scarce resource. So one of the books you should read if you're interested in behavioral economics is Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And let me just read you a quick quote from this book. A series of surprising experiments have shown conclusively that all variants of voluntary effort, cognitive, emotional, or physical, draw at least partly on a shared pool of mental energy. And the chapter goes on to talk about ego depletion and to describe some of these experiments where people are having to make decisions and then their cognitive efforts in other tasks are measured. And oftentimes, of course, as you might uh, expect based on this video, their performance on these cognitive tasks goes down if they have to make a bunch of decisions or if they have to resist temptation. And there's other conditions where it seems like they've used up some of their cognitive efforts doing something and therefore have less for a new task. And the concept of satisficing is closely related to the concept of bounded rationality. Satisficing is basically you saying good enough. When you're trying to optimize, instead of getting to the perfect optimum, you try a few jars of jam and then you pick one. You pick one that's good enough. As long as it's above a certain level of satisfaction, you'll go with it and put no more effort into the decision making. That's satisficing. So we can look at a graphical depiction of bounded rationality. Now, of course, we know that our jam decision has many different components, one of which is sugar density. We know there's all kinds of other components in that vector, but for each of those components, there would be a perfect optimal um, amount of sugar. And we've already talked about it might not be worth the effort to find the very perfect sugar density in, in a jam. Um, in which case, uh, we could have a cutoff. We could say, so once we reached <clears throat> any particular jam that was above our good enough cutoff, we just say, this is fine, we're not going to put more effort into getting near the very, very top of our possible utility function. Where we are now is good enough for the effort we put in. So this is a graphical depiction of satisficing. So satisficing is a concept that is closely linked with bounded rationality. It's a strategy for us to handle our limits on our optimizing capacity. So why do I call bounded rationality the gateway drug to behavioral economics? Well, once you've realized that fully optimizing things is closer to irrational than rational, and that you need these tools, these rules of thumb, to say good enough, that's the right amount of energy to put into that decision making, that opens the door for what kinds of rules of thumb are gonna help people most. And that will be one category that behavioral economics looks at, it's not the only category. 